The third millennium marked the inauguration of a unique train, the Tibet Qinghai Express, that travels from China to Tibet. A railroad through the Himalayas on the roof of the world. The highest railway line on earth leads through breathtaking and fascinating landscapes, from Peking to Lhasa. The entire journey lasts about 48 hours and includes two nights on the train. It starts in China's capital city and then passes through the first emperor's city of Xi'an onto Qinghai province, plus Lanzhou, Xining and Golmud. Our journey begins on a road that for much of the time runs close to the railway line and travels across the high mountain passes of the Kulan Mountains. At a height of 4,767 meters above sea level is a remote high plateau that lies within an earthquake zone and often encounters severe snowstorms. In this extreme habitat, there is a profusion of prayer banners and religious symbols that attract good spirits and frighten off the evil ones. The train winds its way higher and higher from one high plateau to the next, up snow-covered mountains and into the home of the gods. In Golmud in June 2001, construction work began on one of the most spectacular railway lines in the world, of which 80% lies at an altitude of more than 4,000 meters above sea level. Three American General Electric diesel engines pull the train at 11,000 PS safely and securely across the Tibetan high plateau. There are three of 80 new super train engines that have been ordered by the Chinese government for this prestigious project. The thin air at this height takes three engines to do the work of one. Around 930 passengers occupy the train's 16 carriages that are well furnished throughout. In the future, a deluxe service is also planned. In what is known as hard seating class, passengers play cards, pray and sleep as the landscape gradually passes by. Eating is one of the most popular pastimes on the journey and it's very necessary to make sure that the youngest passengers are kept well entertained. Each day, eight trains travel in both directions. Five passenger trains and three freight, with more scheduled in the years ahead. In the train, the thin mountain air goes unnoticed. That's because the carriages are built by Bombardier and therefore have the same comfort value as passenger aircraft. From an altitude of 3,000 meters, the carriages are supplied with oxygen. And if required, each passenger can have their own. The high plateau eventually becomes a narrow valley in which the train travels between great rock walls. Soon the next high valley appears and the surrounding mountain range shows off its ice-covered peaks. For the tourists, this is a magnificent sight. 
but most of the passengers in the second-class carriages have seen it all before and simply want to get from A to B as soon as possible. With the new railway line, Tibet's remote regions have become exposed to the influences of the outside world and particularly to the influence of the Han Chinese. Only a handful of settlements are situated close to the railway line. On the 1st of July 2006, the 85th anniversary of China's Communist Party, the Tibet Line was inaugurated. A technical masterpiece. Of the 45 stations between Golmud and Lhasa, 38 are unmanned as they are equipped with the most modern technology. The danger of earthquake, permafrost, savage storms and unpredictable herds of yak made construction work extremely hazardous. Of the 2,000 kilometer long section, around 550 kilometers of it lie in the various permafrost regions that are negotiated on specially constructed elevated lines. Six hundred and seventy-five bridges and numerous elevated lines cover a total of 160 kilometers, the longest of which measures 11.7 kilometers. The huge bridge structures have been designed to withstand the harsh conditions, including those in summer when the ice melts and would otherwise submerge the rails in mud. The train goes up and up. The highest point is still to come. From the windows, passengers soon become aware of the dramatic effects of climate change. Here, the permafrost is starting to melt. But the line has been well constructed, with walls made of stone and gravel. So the cold wind is able to enter and cool the ground. Ten thousand cooling sticks filled with ammoniac have also been planted in the ground in order to keep the soil at a constant temperature and prevent further melting of the permafrost. The train travels steadily and relatively quietly and provides its passengers with first-class service and highly efficient attendance. Another high valley narrows into a gorge. A thrilling section of the journey. And outside, the air is becoming thinner and thinner. We're now traveling at an altitude of over 5,000 meters. And we're surrounded by six and 7,000 meter high peaks. Moreover, we've also passed the highest train station in the world without stopping. This is the autonomous region of Tibet. Those who travel in first class can sit in the dining car. Soon we arrive at the center of the sky, the heart of the world. Friendly conductors explain the timetable, while the air-conditioned train passes through further beautiful scenery. We travel through the wonderful Amdu train station, but don't stop. It's a beautiful sight. With a population of 35,000, Amdu was a relatively young town that developed as a result of the railroad. It was built by a workforce of 100,000. The route gradually descends into the next high valley another endless permafrost landscape that was once almost inaccessible.
and suddenly it appears. Nam Tso, Heaven Lake, the second largest and highest saltwater lake in China, 70 kilometers long and 30 wide. The turquoise waters of Heaven Lake reflect the icy peaks of the 7,000 meter high Nian Jian Tangla mountain range. And on the banks, Tibetans pray for fertility. The lake lies below us as the train travels on land that is now free from ice. The landscape hardly changes at all, but small buildings appear more frequently. We unexpectedly stop at the small unmanned Diu Ma station. Following a stop of 90 minutes, we continue on our journey. Down still further, through shining green meadows. We've crossed the watershed that lies between the Sangpo and Salween rivers. The railway line winds down on stilt bridges via wide bends into a sheltered valley, past herds of yak. The train slowly approaches the railroad's main town in Tibet. No one has suffered from altitude sickness, and our first contact with Tibet is imminent. Each train stops at Naku Station. The capital of this district has a long history because in 1718 the Manchu army was defeated here by both Tibetan and Mongolian armies. This large train station is in stark contrast to the nearby Yurt camp that stands outside the town's gates and consists mainly of new districts. The nomads continue to live in these colorful, circular tents during the summer, when they travel with their herds of yak and sheep in search of new pastures. A life of freedom. Our journey continues and we're joined by new passengers on this amazing journey. Now only around 300 kilometers separate us from our eventual destination. The Chinese government proudly declared that in the first month following the inauguration of the line, 72,000 travelers took advantage of this brand new service. The train crosses fertile green landscape, endless pastures for herds of yak and sheep at an altitude of 4,000 meters above sea level. The huge stilt bridges bring to mind the permafrost that has frozen the ground up to 30 meters deep. This factor presented an enormous challenge to the creators of the railroad. First, there is a layer that defrosts in summer, while beneath it is constantly frozen ground. The actual permafrost, whose temperature stays at freezing point. The workforce was drawn from each province of China, for five years, they worked under the harshest conditions. But it led to much pride and honor. Along with the Great Wall of China and the Three Gorges Dam, the Tibet Railroad is one of China's greatest structures, a monumental achievement. During the short summers, this remarkable mountain world is similar to a high mountain area in Europe with grazing animals and fertile pastures.
The green mountain slopes reached to the plains, and the stilt route was laid out in a large bow in order to exert less pressure on the sensitive land. The train has introduced further trade and tourism to Tibet, including many foreign influences. And this is causing the Tibetan people some concern. This mysterious land of snow was once only accessible by way of three extremely bumpy roads. And the local people were supplied with lorries. However, today it's not only a million passengers that are transported by train, but also 2.5 million tons of goods, particularly minerals. For the few remaining nomads, little has changed. They continue to roam with their animals and tents across the immense plains. Most notably, their yak, a bulky variety of cattle that thrives at this altitude and provides the nomads with milk, wool, hides and meat. The miracle of railway construction is well acknowledged by one and all. And among the passengers are Tibetans, groups of Chinese, European tourists and a number of Buddhist monks. This ambitious project has been extremely successful and the highest point on Earth crossed by a railroad is 255 meters higher than the Andean Railroad in Peru. To make this project possible, tunnels were used to balance the pressure and were heated during the cold nights. The trains also travel at the highest speeds that are possible on permafrost, 100 kilometers an hour and up to 120. When considering this incredible railroad, it's clear that its planners also had the environment and ecology in mind. The stilt routes look as though they were simply stuck into the mountain slopes high above the Yangtze River by some kind of mythical giant. The next gorge is quite narrow and the dramatic views through the UV protected windows create much excitement among the passengers. The struggle against the harsh landscape was won with much effort and has now allowed this train to serenely make its way through the valleys and gorges situated in this the final leg of the journey. The day comes to an end as the mountains cast long shadows across both valley and railway line. After the last large bridge over the Ki Chu, the Happy River, we've now almost reached our final destination. And here it is. Tired but content, passengers alight from the train. Spacious platforms make it easy to negotiate the station. There's a large arrival hall that features a huge wall relief of Tibet. The new arrivals walk across a huge square that is contained within the huge building. Lhasa is the holy city and place of the gods the capital and also the largest city in Tibet, a land that has been part of China since 1951.
Those who visit the city soon encounter the sacred Barkur Road that is used both as a marketplace as well as a meeting point for young and old alike. For the faithful, a visit to the Zhokang Temple is the main highlight of their long and arduous pilgrimage. Finally, their destination lies nearby. On various special days of the year, a visit to the temple is a must. The pilgrims must wait for several hours outside the gates of the sanctuary. Inside, they worship the abandoned throne of the Dalai Lama. The temple is still a national sanctuary and a living center of Buddhism in Tibet. Attracting many visitors to this remote land, the temple's picturesque inner courtyards are reminiscent of old picture books that depict a colorful and exotic world. Wooden architecture of a bygone time. In the north of the old town is another important temple, Ramache. Built in the seventh century, destroyed by fire on several occasions, and each time rebuilt. This ancient place of culture contains the academy of the esoteric Gelugpa set, and from the roof, the palace mountain seems to be very near. Close by is a nunnery. An authentic new building houses the Tibet Museum that features the works of art of various epochs. From prehistoric times until the time of the kings, when the 33rd king of Tibet, Song San Gampo, relocated his residence here from the Yalung Valley. Chinese immigrants introduced their way of life to this once isolated mountain world including the traditional Tian Hai night market that is now part of everyday life here. Opposite to the Potala and clinging to a rock wall is a small and ancient cave sanctuary, Paliupuk Temple. A steep path that was carved into the rock leads up to the painted caves in which several deities are worshipped. A show theater features age-old traditions in a review. And Tibetans visit the Temple of a Thousand Pictures that is situated at the foot of the Chakpori on an outer pathway. It's an ideal place for prayer. Mighty and towering above Potala, one of the most extraordinary palaces in Asia. Long before the Dalai Lamas, the mountain and its surroundings served as a residence for the early kings of Tibet. Potala is a symbol of the worldly and spiritual power that the 14 Dalai Lamas have possessed for many centuries. The city of the gods on the roof of the world continues to be one of the last mysterious locations on this planet. The train station is a new feature. Mystically illuminated, it looks like a portala of the present day. The arrivals and departures board. The next train for Peking is about to leave and another fascinating train journey through an amazing landscape is about to begin. When the Tibet Qinghai Express will turn yet more dreams into reality. <laughs>